All right. Well, here we go with our first week's effort to uh, have a hybrid class. Uh, Tuesday's plan is for you to have done the tell component of uh, our instruction, which is to have read or uh, interacted with other materials I've provided, in this case the uh, Lilienfeld et al. article on pseudoscience in, in school psychology, and this uh, video. And then uh, this video serves as the show component because I'm going to show you how I work through an example of determining whether something might be scientific or pseudoscientific in uh, reality. And then the due portion will be on Thursday. You'll come to class and I will have given you some specific tasks for in class uh, so you can demonstrate that you uh, possess this skill. All right, so let's get started. The learning goal for this section then is to understand the demarcation or the separation between science and pseudoscience. Uh, I want you to become aware that there are warning signs of pseudoscientific claims. Those are discussed uh, in your Lilienfeld article. I want you to be able to apply these warning signs to identify pseudoscientific claims in uh, practice, and I want you to be able to expose them with some sound argument, which means you need to become fluent at discussing pseudoscientific uh, warning signs against the data you find so that you can make an informed uh, argument for whether you believe or do not believe in something. So let's talk about pseudoscience and pseudopsychology. What are we really talking about there? Well, we've appended pseudo onto the front end of science or psychology, and pseudo comes from the Greek word that means lying or false. Uh, it's about erroneous assertions or practices being set forth as being actual science. So when we say it's pseudoscience or pseudopsychology, we're saying it's not really scientific, it's not really psychology, it's a false belief system that's being set forth as being a true belief system. Now this may sound kind of cut and dried, but in reality nothing is ever black and white, cut and dry, or easy. It's gray. So I want you to uh, click on the Scientific American image in this presentation uh, and go to an article by uh, Michael Shermer that talks a little bit about that demarcation line and how it can be not quite as easy as you might think it is. Uh, pause at that point for a minute, uh, check that out. If you have any problem with it, I've included the URL. You can go there and, uh, and get it that way. Okay, so let's look at some exemplars. What are some things that might be pseudoscientific claims? Well, conversion or reparative therapy could be pseudoscience. That's the therapy that claims it can change the sexual orientation of homosexuals. Subliminal messaging or advertising claims that messages delivered at the subconscious level will modify our behavior at the conscious level. Graphology claims that an individual's personality may be characterized by looking at their handwriting. Psychoanalysis is a unique case of pseudoscientific claim because it is pseudoscientific in one respect, but it's also easily argued. This is the core of the Shermer article. Okay, Popper says to be science, you have to be falsifiable. Of course, since he didn't do anything empirical, it was just a collection of, of uh, theories. It was more philosophical. It couldn't be confirmed, yet he behaved as if it was. And then the one I've thrown in, I talked a little about in class the other day, just to give you a hint, it was coming. And that's cognitive training programs. Uh, that make claims that practicing lower level cognitive skills like working memory or attention can generalize to improve higher level kinds of skills like academic or behavioral or social outcomes. Now in the Lilienfeld article you became familiar with 10 warning signs of pseudoscience and they said it was relevant to school psychologists and of course it is but it's relevant to all psychology and all science. Uh, we can look at any claim and use these 10 warning signs to help us to determine whether maybe we should be concerned about that claim or not so concerned about that claim. So uh, these include lack, lack of falsifiability, uh, meaning that they don't offer or cannot be tested. Either they can't be tested or they don't offer falsifiable evidence. Uh, lack of self-correction, even once uh, an error in the logic or an error in the evidence is presented, they don't change, they just stick to their guns. Uh, this is clearly how it is. Uh, an emphasis on confirmation. This is where we only look at the data that says what we want it to say. 
If I want to tell you that something works, I don't evaluate anything except data that says it works. Evasion of peer review. Peer review is a powerful part of science. It's the part of science that uh, subjects our ideas and our methodology to other experts and gives them the opportunity to demonstrate that there were errors in it and that it perhaps isn't accurate. Um, if it survives a peer review, then it's uh, made stronger. An over-reliance on testimonial or academic, or academic, ac anecdotal evidence. Uh, anecdotal evidence are stories, and stories are what you get in testimonial. So uh, if I'm going to rely on telling you that uh, someone you might revere either because of their position or their fame or their authority uh, believes that something is true, and then I have them tell you the story about how it has been true for them, that is testimonial and anecdotal evidence. Generally, we don't see that used to support things that are truly scientific, because if we have scientific evidence, we present that instead. So when we see anecdotal evidence, when we see testimonial evidence, that's usually what's offered in the absence of scientific evidence, and it's a pretty good indicator that pseudoscience is in the neighborhood. Absence of connectivity refers to the fact that science builds knowledge uh, in small pieces and assembles that into theory. The theories are the organized evidence for how something functions. And uh, in the absence of an organized collective uh, body of, of uh, data that shows us how something works, then uh, we can't connect things. So uh, when an idea stands on its own uh, without being connected to other ideas, that's a clue that this may not be true theory, this may not be true science. Pseudoscience often makes extraordinary claims. Science doesn't make extraordinary claims. Science reports the data. Science reports the outcome. Uh, whether that data is uh, exciting or whether it's mundane, uh, it's what we talk about. Pseudoscience, on the other hand, is interested in getting our attention, so it reports really phenomenal things, things we haven't seen before, effects that are bigger than we would have expected. Uh, when it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, famous uh, uh, scientist Carl Sagan once said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So you can see how that might play into this discussion about pseudoscience. The ad antiquatum fallacy simply means that's the way we've always known it, that's the way it's always been, that's what we've always believed, therefore that must be true. Uh, that's a pretty weak way of knowing. Uh, and yet it's often offered, and when that is offered, we probably are dealing with pseudoscience. Pseudoscience resists that change. It uh, stays where it was in order to uh, make its point. The use of hypertechnical language is another clue. Hypertechnical language is just trying to sound like science. If you're not science and you want to be seen as science, one of the things you can do is, is up the ante with your language. So you throw out uh, either little snippets or great big pieces of uh, really fancy language to make us think, oh, this is science. This has to be science. It's complicated. And then the absence of boundary conditions. Uh, boundary conditions, we're talking about uh, uh, not paying attention to where we may or may not be effective. We're, we're generalizing beyond the scope of uh, what our evidence would suggest we can do. And we'll see some examples and talk about some examples of that in, in today's uh, lesson. So these are your 10 warnings. The Lilienfeld article also uh, introduced you to some widespread cognitive errors uh, that can be the basis for uh, these warning signs. And these include things like confirmation bias, the tendency to seek out and see what we want. Uh, things like uh, illusory correlation, the tendency to perceive a real association or a causal association between things that are not related, uh, groupthink, and a number more. You should uh, uh, make sure you familiarize yourself with those. When we start talking about critical thinking, when we start talking about critically evaluating things, uh, these are some errors that we have to avoid. This is, uh, this is where we fall down on the job. So for this week's show part, I'm going to do a worked example. So thinking back to Shermer and thinking about the cognitive errors and thinking about the uh, warning signs of um, pseudoscience, 
we need to uh, approach brain training. First, we need to make sure we know what is the claim. Uh, brain training products make a lot of different claims. Uh, we have to be sure that we weigh the scientific validity of a specific claim to classify that claim as science or pseudoscience. Uh, if something makes a claim for, uh, many of these make claims for um, uh, treating post-stroke victims or brain injury victims, uh, which would potentially be quite different from the claims they might make about effectiveness in general social behavior or in uh, improved academic performance. So we want to look at specific scientific validity for specific claims because we might accept some products as being uh, science for some of their claims and pseudoscience or failing the boundaries test for other claims. So brain training encompasses a number of products. Uh, in order to select one and to try to do so in a non-biased way, I went to Google and I Googled brain training. The number one return for brain training is Lumosity. Uh, Lumosity has done a very good job of marketing its 